How are we doing? Good to see all of you, and I'm glad to be back today, and so we're excited to have all of you here in worship with us. Also, for everyone joining us online, I know uh, many of you are watching from home today, and so, uh, but we've got a special series and message that we're going to start today, but before I do, uh, I did want to pass on some information. Uh, I was letting you know last week uh, that... Uh, John and Weva, they're a great part of our church, and if you're new with us, uh, you could just hang in there with me, but they've uh, been a phenomenal part for the last, um, well, over, coming on 30 years now. It's been an amazing journey, but Weva uh, has a different worship experience. She's with the Lord today, and uh, she passed this morning, but if you'd be praying for the family, we're sad and joyful all at the same time, uh, but uh, I know she's in a great place, but if you'd be praying for them as they go through uh, mourning and joy, because they know she's with Jesus, but at the same time, it's always hard to let go. And so, uh, but we never die as believers. So you know that, right? We don't ever die. And so to be absent here is to be with the Lord. It's a, it's a great moment. So, um, but I wanted to pass that on to you so you can be praying because we're all family. And so even if you're new with us, uh, you'll learn we're, we're one big family. And so we do this together and I uh, wanted to pass that on. But um, also there's a lot going on today. Right after service, we have really two things going on. So we, uh, we've been doing a discipleship. We just came out of a discipleship series. For those of you, the staff did a phenomenal job. And uh, so we've been doing discipleship where uh, for those of you that want to be discipled, you want to keep growing in your faith, we have a resource. And really, we just share life together after service. So you guys will be meeting in Fun Forest today. Typically, they go to the basement, but you're going to be in Fun Forest today. So it's in the kid wing. It's the last the last room on the left. So uh, even if you're new, you want to jump on board, uh, look, they're going through a resource, but you can jump on at any time. And so if you wanted to join in today, you're more than welcome. Uh, pastor Brian will be meeting you there. And for, we also have meet the pastors today right after second service, and that'll be in the basement. So if you're new to Westridge, newer to Westridge, you've been coming for quite some time, uh, we'd love to be able to meet you. We'll be down downstairs just to answer questions. It'll be, it'll be brief. We won't keep you a long time, but we do want to hear your story, and we want to share a little bit about the vision of the church and any questions we could answer. Uh, we just wanted to make this uh, as simple and as easy for you to uh, really get connected or decide if this is going to be your church where you're going to serve. So you can join us. That'll be in the basement. So if you go right by the cafe uh, and there's some stairs that go down uh, and you can meet us right down there right after service. So that's happening. And then today uh, there's a Steelers game I hear, right? So the first game of the year, uh, the, men's, the men's ministry is meeting over at Awaken. Uh, they're going to be watching the game together. So men, you're welcome to come out and celebrate. And if you're one of those people that just like, I just want to watch the game. I don't want anyone bugging me, that kind of stuff. So we have like a 90-inch screen and a couple 60-inch screens and and uh, the best sound system you'll ever have for a football game. So if you want to do that, they have a sanctuary, you go there. But that, then there's a lobby as well. And so if you want to eat wings, we have over 300 chicken wings. So we need a lot of you to come out and eat some wings. But uh, but you can have fellowship and watch the game as well. Or if you want to just watch the game and uh, cheer on our Steelers to their their first victory, you can do that. Um, I love We love our, our Pittsburgh teams, right? So we have uh, some Riverhounds players that, that are here first service. They had a tie this week, and they're playing on Wednesday. Uh, and then we have the Pirates. It's just long-suffering with the Pirates. You just keep praying for the Pirates, right? All right. Well, let's get into our series. And so I just want to kind of give you those updates. But, yeah, feel free, men. You don't have to sign up, by the way, for Meet the Pastors. Just come if you want to be there. Men, you don't, if you missed registration, you didn't sign up, it's okay. Just go. Uh, and if you've got some uh, boys, if you've got a young boy or teenager, they're they more than welcome to come with you, all right? So bring them on and out as well. Uh, we are starting a new series called Meology. All right, so I got to do the I got to do the space. Otherwise, for you cat lovers, you'll think I'm saying a whole different thing. Me. Ology, all right? And so uh, if you know anything about, uh, maybe you've heard the word. Now, this isn't a word. I made it up. And so if you were wondering, like, where did that come from? It's not. I made it up. Uh, but there's a word that you are familiar with called theology, all right? So theology is, ology is the study of God. In the original Greek, it's the study. And theo means God. So it's the study of God. So uh, in this situation, ology means the study. And me means me or you, us. Um, now, uh, today, I wanted to start this series because I think a lot of us uh, and as I've been praying, and, and so I, uh, for those of you that are new, uh, we kind of go through a process and vision retreat, and so I, I usually um, usually craft out our whole year's messages, but based on what the Lord's leading me to do, but this has been one that I've really been feeling, because a lot of us, uh, you know, we're all human, by the way, and so God made us, He did create us in His image, that's true for all of us, uh, but we also have a flesh nature, we have a sin, uh, we all have uh, sin, we've all are sinners, and we've made mistakes, and we've ran away from God, we've been mad at God, or whatever your situation may be, uh, all of us have, have a flesh now that, that really desires things uh, that we want. They may, not, they may have nothing necessarily to do with God. It may not even be God's heart, but all of us have this drawing. In fact, 
Paul describes it like this in Romans, that there's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. And it's a real battle. Even as believers, we have this battle because we all have an old self. We have an old man. We lived before Christ, before we gave our life to Jesus. We have this reality of uh, you know, what we like, our pleasures, our desires, all of those things. Now, those aren't necessarily bad, but we do have to understand what God's called us to do and what his heart is and what he says. So that is what this series is all about, uh, meology is is understanding that all of us have this nature, this flesh nature. There's this battle. Now, the way we win this battle, uh, honestly, is, is Jesus tells us we have to die to ourselves. That's part of Luke says we have to die to ourselves every day, daily. Uh, and as disciples, the word, you know, as you guys have learned through this series, and if you're new with us, a disciple is a follower of Christ. It's a follower of the Messiah. It's a follower of Jesus. And so uh, as followers, we have to be okay with being underneath Jesus, knowing what he's teaching us. Jesus says it, another way he says it is, I'll know my disciples because they follow my teaching. Now, this isn't legalism or ritualism or, or just doing things to check boxes, but uh, really a desire. We, we want to follow Jesus because we know that he's God. He knows what's best for us. He made us. He loves us. And anything he's, he's calling us to do is a blessing for us as, as followers of Christ. And so that's just a reality. Uh, but we live in a culture and it's not any different than when Jesus lived, by the way. And it's not any different from uh, the early moments of creation. Uh, every culture, now, you know, experiential, it might be a different, but uh, Ecclesiastes says it this way. There's nothing new under the sun. Now, the experience may be new, but the root problem, the root cause, the root sin that's, that's really rising itself up is the same. Even though we live in 2022, we still face a lot of the same issues Jesus faced when he was on earth. And, and Jesus obviously walked into a culture as leaving heaven and coming to be a man like he created uh, was still happening in the early days in Judges. In fact, the Bible records it this way. If you've ever read, uh, re read the Bible all the way through from cover to cover, and it, if we had God's perspective and we could see from, from the uh, end pages of Revelation to 2022, you would see a similar pattern as a cycle. We all have this cycle. In fact, in Judges, uh, it says this a lot of times. If you read in the Old Testament, it says, when there's a good king, things are good. Really what it's saying is, when a king chooses to worship God, things are good. When there's a bad king, or a king that is taking us away from the word of God, things are bad. And the same is true in our culture, regardless if it's a king or a president or a government or, or whatever the hierarchy is. Now, Jesus uh, has always spoken to the Old Testament because I don't want you to be ruled by man. I want you to worship me. I don't want you to put men over me. But we chose, and, and God gave us that choice to say, hey, if you want men to rule over you, that's fine. But here's, here's some of the things that are going to happen. And he told us this a long time ago. But here we are in 2022 with this compounding issue of we're, we're allowing things to happen in our culture that are contrary to God. That's what meology is, is that we, we all have these tendencies, these things that we keep going back to. Now, regardless if they're, if they're uh, for God or they're against God, uh, we need to understand what God's heart is. And as followers, we must choose to follow Christ, regardless of what culture says, regardless of your friends. All my friends are doing it. So why, why can't I do it? Well, are you following Jesus? And what does Jesus have to say? And so in this series, we're really going to walk through, and Jesus had a lot of great encounters with, with government leaders, religious leaders. In fact, the people he, were, he was most frustrated with were not, the, were not the sinners or the people that were not following God. It was, it was those leaders and governmental leaders or religious leaders that were, uh, really knew what God's heart was but weren't following it themselves. We, we know that Jesus went into the synagogue one time and flipped tables. That's because they knew God's heart, but they were doing the opposite. And so that frustrated the Lord. And so my point in this series is, is all of us are human by nature. We all have this tendency to choose things that, that aren't necessarily God's heart. So what do we do with that? And even though it may be blaring in my culture, or even though it may be all over, and by the way, this isn't politics. I'm not here to get political. I really... Um, I appreciate politics, but I, at the same time, I don't allow politics to rule my life. I allow Jesus to rule my life. And if there's anything that's spoken, then we want to we align it with what does God's word have to say? What is being said and what does God's heart? And, how, and, then, and then we have to make a choice. Am I going to follow culture? Am I going to follow my friends? Am I going to follow what's popular, what's cool? Or, or am I going to stick to being a follower of Christ, which means I'm going to follow my teacher? I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to be a follower. 
And let me just say, it's not always popular to follow Jesus. In, in the world's culture, obviously the enemy doesn't, Satan doesn't want to follow Jesus. He got thrown out of heaven. But this whole uh, series in meology is understanding that we all think things. And just because I'm your pastor doesn't mean that I have wrong thoughts. I have wrong thoughts. You have wrong thoughts. There's, there's times when, listen, we all wake up and maybe we don't want to worship God today. Or maybe we don't want to have time with the Lord. Or maybe we don't have time to open our Bibles and read them. Look, we all have these tendencies. We all have these feelings. The question is, is how do we win this battle? And I, I just want, to, I want you to see in the series, the only way you're going to win, Ephesians 6 says it this way, is that you would put on the armor. And the armor in Ephesians 6 is the word of God. It's, now, it describes it as a helmet or a breastplate or a belt or a shot or whatever, whatever the equipment that we understand in the physical is, but all of them correlate to the word of God. It's scripture. This is how you win is by having a relationship with Jesus and choosing. This is how Jesus won. When he stood before Satan face to face and Satan said, I want you to worship me. And he says, no, I, you only worship God alone. It was scripture that he overcame. It was scripture that he became victorious. Yes, he was God, but he was a man like us, and he had to make a choice to love God with all he had in that moment and to choose God. And so uh, our theme verse is Philippians chapter 2. Uh, you'll find uh, uh, this verse, and look, the context really is, but I, I want you to see this verse. It says, for everyone looks out for their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that your interests aren't important. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care about your desires. But the reality is for us as followers, we align our care, our desires, our interests with what the kingdom is doing and what God is doing. There's a lot of great, uh, you know, we live in a culture right now. We live in 2020. There's a lot of like self-help books. Self-help, self, and they, there's a lot of great quotes. And, and honestly, you can read these quotes differently as a Christ follower, or you can, if you're not a Christ follower, you can read them another way. But they, they, uh, if I kind of put them in context, they really don't align with Christ's heart at all. So one of them is, you be you. You be you. Great quote. Easy to remember, right? You be you. I don't know about you, but I needed saved from myself. So you be used fine if you're following Jesus, you understand who you are in Christ. But the reality, without me, without Jesus, I'm a depraved human being that is a sinner that needs help. So you be used a little bit different when we look at it through the human perspective and through God's perspective. Here's another one. Paul, uh, Paulo Colo says this, never apologize for being yourself. That's a good Pittsburgh saying, right? <laughs> Just speak your mind. It is what it is. Never apologize for being yourself. If you're married, you know that never goes well, does it? <laughs> Nike says it this way. Don't believe you have to be like anybody to be somebody. I think that's a cool quote. That's a pretty good slogan. Don't believe you have to be like anybody to be somebody. Yoko Ono says this. You change the world by being yourself. Really? Really? Buddha says it this way, another religion. You work to discover your world, and then with all your heart, you give yourself to it. So we worship the world? Be who you are, Dr. Seuss. Be who you are, say how you feel, because those who mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. Dr. Seuss is a deep book, isn't it? That's a deep thing. That's good. The point is, there's a lot of opinions out there. There's a lot of things that have been said. Maybe you like some of these quotes. Maybe you put them on your fridge or you, you have a little wristband or whatever. But the whole point of this series is to help drive you understand. And we just sang a great song right before I came up here. You are, I am who you say I am. You got to know that God made you. God created you. And you've got to understand what he says about you. You see, too many times in meology, when we think about ourselves, we're looking to other people. We're looking to the world. We're looking to our parents. We're looking to our boss. We're looking to our jobs. And listen, I, I want to be first to tell you, I had a hard time overcoming this. I'm a people pleaser. 
and my past life and my old self. I just wanted to please people, which, which means it can go a very, very wrong way for us. In fact, a lot of the hurt and pain in my life is because that I would strive or I'd work, I'd work my hardest to please people, and I'd get hurt by the very people I'm trying to please. Now, I understand that people can also be a blessing, so I'm not saying they always are going to hurt you. People can be a blessing as well, but I want you to understand something. If your whole focus and your whole shift is on pleasing people, I can promise you you're going to get hurt in that process because the people didn't create you. People don't know you. They don't know what your gifts are. They don't know what your talents are. They don't understand you like God understands you. That doesn't mean we don't work hard. In fact, Colossians says we don't work on the man, we work on the Christ. So you work hard. You work for the Lord. Anytime you work hard and you work for the Lord, you're going to be a blessing to who you're working with or working for. But you see, the mind shift is different. I'm not not here as your pastor to please you. I'm here to please God. And I know that for me and for you, put yourself in your own situation. The more that I worship and I seek and I please God, the more that I'm going to be a blessing to other people. That's just the way it works. That's the way God designed it. I'm not serving Jesus to get something. I'm serving Jesus because I love Jesus. And because of that, things come out of it. So there's this, there's this really understanding. As disciples, we've got to learn that God is retraining our minds. He's refocused. And Romans 12, 2 says that we transform our minds and renew our minds by the word of God. That's why it's so important that we pray. That's why it's so important that we, that we read scripture, that we worship together, that we come together, that we are the church together. It's so important because we're retraining our minds. And by the way, it's always a blessing when we have God's heart in our heart. For me, um, and maybe for you, I'm only going to speak for myself. Please know that I sat in these chairs just like you. I met Jesus in these chairs just like you. But I remember coming in those doors. They were over here when I came. They're now in the middle. They were over there. And I came in, and I sat in the back row. I like to sit in the back row because I could get out quick. I'm not saying that's why you're sitting in the back row. So please don't. <laughs> so that didn't come out right, did it? But I, I, I knew that was me. And I'm telling you, every time I came and I heard that pastor, it was the founding pastor of this church. We're celebrating 30 years in October. He's going to be coming uh, to share with you. But I remember coming, and I remember it wasn't, I didn't get saved because of the pastor. I got saved because of Jesus. But I remember as he was speaking the word of God, I'm like, it was hitting me. There's, there's another verse in the Bible that says, the word God, it separates between the bone and the marrow. It, like, it just takes what's going on in your life and helps separate to say, look, that's you, that's me, that's meology, and that's God. And there's this interesting tension, isn't there? Between you know what God wants from me, you you know the expectation, you know the desire has for you. And by the way, it's not to control you, it's not to manipulate you, it's to bless you. And then you know what you want. We all want certain things. Now, for me, it was honestly, I was really caught up in succeeding and, and the job that I had. It was about making. <laughs> whatever amount of money you think is right. It was having a position. It was having a stature. At one point, I really just wanted to own my own place, my own restaurant. I wanted to work. I started working in retail and working in, in uh, at Lazarus. It was before it was Lazarus. It was Macy's. And I just wanted to climb. I wanted to keep pleasing my boss, pleasing people. And it, that spurred me into working an unhealthy amount of hours. In fact, I got to the mentality like, well, if I'm not there, it can't operate. How many of you know that's just such a lie? <laughs> such a, many people have worked there before me, and it's still surviving. But you get to this, you, get, you start lying to yourself. Like, well, I have to be there. You sacrifice your family, your marriage. You sacrifice all of these things, your faith. Well, I can't work on Sundays because, well, they're open on Sundays. Whatever happened to you saying, look, God's important to me, and I'm going to worship, and then I'll come to work after? Amen. Or whatever happened to saying, no, Sunday's my Sabbath. I don't work on Sundays. By the way, that's I work on Sundays, so my Sabbath's on Mondays. I'm not saying, (laughs) don't take stuff out of context, people. You get what I'm saying? 
Meology is this understanding that we're all human. We don't always think right. We don't always think like God. Now, God made us and God created us, but the only way you're going to become like God is if you seek God. You've got to seek God. This, let, me, let me share. I'm always here sharing two points with you, but let me share this first one. And it's a little bit, it's simple but mind-blowing at the same time. And it really rocked me when I, was, when I was seeking God and trying to understand this. But it was, your treasure shows your heart. Now, I've heard this from many preachers through my days. I've been following the Lord for quite some time now. And they use this as a tithe message. I get it. It's about tithing and it's not. What Jesus is saying is, show me your treasure and I'll show you your heart. And some of you are saying, I don't have any treasure. Well, what are you talking about you don't have any treasure? I'm not talking about like you dive in the ocean and you find a treasure full of gold and necklaces and crowns. I don't think any of us has that, do we? If you do, maybe we need to talk. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus says, show me your treasure and I'll show you your heart. Matthew 6 21. And by the way, uh, Brian and the staff did an amazing job with this passage. Matthew 6, if you don't know anything about that, the context of Matthew 6 is, as people, we worry about everything. And God says, I don't want you to worry about anything, about the clothes you wear, the food you eat, the people. I don't want you to worry. I don't want you to be anxious for anything. I want you to seek first the kingdom of God, and I'll take care of everything else. The priority is seek me first. I'll take care of the rest. I don't care what the it is or what the what is or what what you're searching for in life. If you seek God, he'll take care of it. It may not be what you want or how you would do it or how you come around it or the time frame. But let me just tell you something. When God answers, it's always better than what you and I come with anyway. God just says, look, I want your priorities. I want you to understand if when I look at your treasure, now your treasure will be this. Well, let, let's just think about it this way. We'll have some fun. Where's all your time go? Where's all your resources go? Money. What do you spend money on? Now, please hear me. This isn't necessarily bad, but I'm telling you, if, if you're like me, when I was trying to follow God, I wanted to follow God, I was like on this line, like, I like what I'm hearing, but I don't want to give up. But I, what I didn't realize is I don't necessarily always have to give up. I just got to put God first. It's like somebody that loves grass. Any of you love grass? Not that grass. Grass. Like <laughs> grass. Like cutting the grass. You like cutting the grass? Some of you like to have green grass. Like it's got to be green and lush and you step on it and it's like a massage on your foot. It's beautiful. And some of you, the lines got to be a certain way. And if they're, not, if they're not a certain way, you can't worship on Sunday. You just can't do it. It just throws you out of context. It's all out of court. And it, but here's, here's my point. If, and this is just a fun analogy. If you love grass, where's all your time going to go? Well, your time's going to go doing research. Like, man, there's, there's like these holes coming out. There's, there's moles in my grass. How do I get rid of the moles? So you're going to start doing some research, aren't you? You're going to look up Google. You're going to ask Siri. You're going to ask your neighbor, hey, what do you do with your moles? How do you get rid of your moles? By the way, there's a lot of ways to get rid of moles. And that little thing that makes noise doesn't work, trust me. (laughs) So you're going to spend time researching. You're probably going to have a pretty nice mower if you love grass. Right? Give it a nice zero turn, nice tractor. You want to make sure it leaves good lines, cuts the same consistency. You're probably going to spend a lot of money on Chemicals, organics, whatever your pet peeve is. You're going to spend a lot of resources on how to get that grass green. You're going to do a lot of research on what do I need to put on it? How do I aerate it? What do I do at all? How do I make it look that? And then you're going to see your neighbor Steve's lawn, and it's greener than yours, and you're going to make an internal competition with yourself. You're not going to tell Steve, by the way, that's not happening, Steve. (laughs) You're not going to have greener grass than me. Now, that's just a fun analogy, and maybe you're feeling convicted. Listen, you can have nice grass and love Jesus, by the way. (laughs) The point is, is that why would we worship anything but Jesus? We can worship Jesus and 
love other things. You can have desires. Some of you are great at sports. One of the guys in here last service is a soccer player for the Riverhouse. Look, you can love Jesus and do what your passion is, what your desires. There's a verse in Psalms that says, God, he'll, he'll meet your desires. He's going to help. He knows your desires. He understands you. He made you. He gave you the gifts and the talents for you to do what you're doing. It's not that God's going, ah, I know you love it. Too bad. Can't have it. That's not what God's doing, but that's what we think in our head, that we have a God that's trying to take away all of our joy. No, 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 no. God is saying, I want to be part of your joy. I am joy. So Matthew 6, 21, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. All God is saying is like, take an inventory. Where's your treasure? I'm just being honest. For me, there was a time in my life when my treasure was in material things. I had to have certain cars, certain things. I wanted a house. I wanted certain things. But in, in the big scope of things, in the kingdom perspective, none of that really matters. Now, it's important to me, so it's important to God. But why would I put that above Jesus? If God's looking down on my treasures, he needs to be one of my treasures. So, yes, that means I give my time and I give my energy and I give finances to the Lord. Of course I do all of those things. But listen, it's not, well, I, I gave that, so Jesus, you've got to bless me. No. God, you died for me and saved me and changed me and blessed me. It's an honor for me to give you anything. It's an honor for me to come worship on Sundays. It's an honor for me to be united with the body of Christ. It's an honor for me to serve if I'm at Walmart or if I'm at church. It really doesn't matter. I don't just worship on Sunday. I worship on Monday through Saturday and Sunday as well. Do you see? Look, and by the way, it's so much more fun if you love grass to invite Jesus into the grass. Because the same God that made you made the grass. He made it all. You see, when it comes to meology, yes, you're a piece of the puzzle. Like, you're a part of. So you've got to understand yourself, but you also got to understand the God that made you. And you, they have to come together. We all walked apart away from Christ. We all walked without God. At that point, you were a sinner. I have a big pet peeve, and if I've ever corrected you, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry, right? Because a lot of us, when we get saved and we give our life to Jesus, we start walking with God. We say, I'm a sinner. No, you're not. You were a sinner before you met God, but now you're a saint. The Bible says you're a saint. Now, don't go around saying, hey, I'm St. John. That doesn't work well. That's, that's arrogance and pride. That's not what I'm talking about. He's saying you're a saint because you've been set apart. You're now his child. You're now his son. You're now his daughter. You're now part of his family. You're going to spend eternity with Jesus. So, obviously, Jesus is going to say, hey, come on to heaven, sinners. No, he's going to say, come to heaven, saints. Come, my kids. Come, my bride. That's what Wave is experiencing right now. That's the way it works. But how many of us, myself included, I've, I've met with so many people that they're saved. They've given their life to Jesus. They're, they're trying, look, and we're not perfect. We all mess up. You can be a saint and still sin, but you're no longer a sinner. You're no longer separated from God. You've been saved by God, set apart for righteous acts to do the, the, the goods or the things that God, God has planned for you to do good. He will complete in you. Until the coming, by the way, of Jesus Christ. Even if you go away, what God's doing in you is going to continue beyond you. Because it's his kingdom. It's his work. You see, that's why we have to, when we think about us, meology, when we think about the study of us, when we think, we've got to understand that God is, yes, he's in your life, but you've got to make choices. We're not robots. God isn't controlling you. Now, he could. He could say, you're going to worship me and make you worship. In fact, there will be a time when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But let me tell you, if you haven't confessed by then, you're in trouble. God gives you a will and he gives you a choice. Your treasure shows your heart. And I'll just challenge you, you know, what's your treasure? And just be honest with God. I, and by the way, I don't know your treasure. I don't know where you're at. I'm not looking at your finances. 
All I'm saying is, is God knows your heart because he can look and see. And I don't know about you, but I just want to make sure that when God's peering in on my heart and he's looking at me, that he sees himself. And that everything I'm doing, and it doesn't matter if I'm pastoring at this church or I'm, I'm at my house or I'm cutting my grass or I'm taking care of the animals that God's given me, and that's just my kids. <laughs> Especially you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> she just wants $5. My kids know if I mention them, they get $5. So she's, just, she's adding up. It's 10 I think you get it, right? Where's your treasure? And I don't want you to feel shameful. I don't want you to feel condemned. I don't want you to feel like, listen, if you're, if you're just being honest and your treasure isn't God, just talk to God about what you need to do. And I, I want to guarantee you this, that what you love and what your passion is and what your desire is, that God is going to use that in a different way. You'll still, you know, when I look at my life before Christ and what I'm doing today, really the what I'm doing, I'm, I'm still working with people. I manage people all my life. I'm still working with people. I'm still managing people just like I was. I'm in a different environment. I, I understand I'm not, I'm not in the retail or the restaurant world, but I could be. It wouldn't matter if I was there or I was here. But what's amazing is, is now I'm worshiping God. I'm following Jesus. I understand that he's called me and saved me and changed me. And now I understand that I'm, I'm shepherding people because that's what he's called me to do. For years, I was frustrated because people kept coming to me with their problems. And I'd say, good Lord, just fold the shirt. <laughs> just serve the plate. Just give the customer good food. I don't need to hear about all your problems. You're still getting paid. I'm still signing your paycheck. That's not part of my job description. I'm just your manager. I'm just here to, to lead you through this shift. But now I understand, no, the reason why that's happening to me is because God's made me a shepherd, a pastor. And I didn't realize that before, God, that's why it was happening. And it was frustrating to me there. But now I understand, God, you want me to feed and lead people. And now the frustration has now turned into joy. Now I love it and I enjoy it. So what I'm saying to you is it, is it looks a lot the same, but God is able to do something miraculous and supernatural that you didn't have over here. So keep following Jesus. Keep following the Lord. Yes, your desires. Now, if your desire and passion is way away from God, he may ask you to make a shift and a change, but it's going to be okay. It'll be a blessing to you. So your treasure shows your heart. Second, the me priority. Now, this isn't self-help. This isn't like get rich fast. This isn't any of that stuff. There was a discussion between Jesus and the Pharisees and the Sadducee, and here's how it went. They were trying to trick Jesus, and they asked Jesus, listen, it's no different than our culture today. The culture today is still trying to trick the church and trying to, like, berate or get the church to think a way that, they, that the culture thinks and not God, right? This is happening today just like it was happening with Jesus. Oh, you're not thinking like the culture, so that means you're this. You're what? Get used to labels, my friends. Amen. Be okay with being a follower of Jesus. Don't get all bent out of shape if they label you as something. Get all bent out of shape if you're not following Jesus. That's when you want to get bent out of shape. Amen. But this was happening with Jesus. He's talking to these religious leaders. And by the way, these weren't just religious leaders. These were governmental powers as well. They, this was the Romans. They were in control. They were the religious leaders. They were the elite. And they were the ones training, by the way. They were the ones making disciples. Unfortunately, they were making disciples based on culture, not on Jesus. And so when Jesus, if you remember, he was flipping over tables. The reason why he was flipping over tables is because they were having church, but not praying to God, not even having God's presence being entered into the building. And he walked in, the very presence, God himself walked into the building, and they're trying to rip people off. Of course God's flipping tables. That's not my heart. That's not what the Father's house looks like. And this is what's happening. And so these same religious leaders that, that are trying to deceive people and lie to people and take their money and steal from them, these same people, Jesus walked in. By the way, that sounds a lot of like sometimes that happens in our culture, doesn't it? And Jesus walked up to them and they asked him a question. They said, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? And this is where the vision of this church stands. This is where, that's not just the vision of the church. This should be our life vision. 
And this is what Jesus said to them. Now, they were trying to trick him. They were trying to trip him up. But here's what Jesus said, and it blew them away. He said, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your heart and soul and your mind. And he said, the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, by the way, there's over 600 in the Old Testament. This is what these other religious people were talking about, is trying to trip them up on the other 600. But he said, on these two commandments, all the law and the prophets hang on these two. Love God, love people. And when I say the meat priority, because look, it says, Jesus said to them, you shall, you shall. And then it goes on to say, after you shall love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, the first is greater, and the second is, you shall, you shall love your neighbor. That's me. That's you. You see, we have to make a choice. You have to make a choice to love God. You have to make a choice to worship God. You've got to make a choice to pray. You've got to make a choice to read the Bible. You've got to make a choice to have a relationship with the living God. You have to make that choice. You shall love God. That's where the first part of our vision comes from. We've got to love God. Because without loving God, we won't know who we are. And the second one doesn't work if we don't know the first one. If you can't love God, then you can't receive from God. But if you do love God, then you begin to receive. Listen, it's awesome. Now I understand, and I hope you don't understand, or if you don't now, you will today. Jesus saved me. And Jesus probably saved many of you in this room. But if, he, if you haven't been saved, or you're not following Jesus, or he's not your Lord, you can make that decision today. You shall love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not a process. You're going to keep growing in Christ. But let me just tell you something. I don't care if you've been following Jesus for 30 years. You're going to keep growing in Christ from day one until you meet him in heaven. And you're still going to grow even in eternity. That's why it's good to be a disciple and be a learner and be a follower. You shall love God. You've got to start there. Because in that moment, God's not only going to save you, but he's going to teach you about forgiveness, right? We have to repent, which means we've got to say, God, I messed up, and God, I need you to forgive me. And God will forgive you. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he shed his blood, to wash you clean of all your sins. To make you new, a new creation, a new person. That's what all those light bulb uh, spots are open for. If you're here today and you're giving your life to Jesus, we want to give you a light bulb. I want you to plug it in because it symbolizes that you made a commitment to follow Jesus or you made a commitment to come back to Jesus. Maybe you ran away and you're coming back. That's why those light bulbs are out there. You shall love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. As God forgives you, if you receive his forgiveness, now guess what you can do? Now you can forgive others. Freely you've received, freely you can give. That's why the second is just as important as the first. If you can love God, then you start to receive forgiveness, you start to receive grace, you get to receive love and joy and kindness. Do you see what God's doing in you? He's transforming you. He's changing you. He's making you new. He's making you look like him. And as you receive all these things, as you receive them for yourself, now you can love your neighbor. But you can't love your neighbor without loving God. Otherwise, you're just going to be spewing stuff at your neighbor that you're not following yourself. Oh, don't you hate that? Don't you hate it when people are hypocritical towards you? you got to do that, but they're not doing it themselves. And I know that's happened in the Christian world sometimes. But that's because this principle gets out of line. The priorities get out of line. It's just like those religious leaders telling people how to live, and Jesus walked in and said, hey, this isn't how you should be living, and he corrected them. But they weren't disciples. They weren't learners. They, didn't, they weren't teachable. Love God, love people. You see, it's a loving God that you learn about who you are. That God begins to show you what he made you to be, who he created you, where your gifts are, where your talents are, where your passion is, where your love is, and how all of that fits together for the kingdom. And then as you receive from God, now you can help your neighbor. Now you can give away to your neighbor. Now you can show them grace. And you can, you know, I, I used to, uh, when I think about my history and I think about my faith journey here at West Ridge, I, I remember that when I got saved and I realized that God forgave me, then I realized 
you know, that I could start to forgive other people. When I started to realize what God was doing in me and speaking in me, then I could start encouraging other people. When I started to realize that God is amazing and, and he does things that we can't expect or imagine, now I can encourage other people to say, look, we have a great God, and it really is just an awesome, awesome life. That's why Jesus said, I've come to give you abundant life. I didn't come to give you mediocre. I came to give you a phenomenal life. Then why is it that when we walk in these doors, I'm speaking about myself, why is it when we walk in these doors, we think that God doesn't love me, that God can't forgive me, like I have the greatest sin that could ever be paid from Jesus. Jesus couldn't pay my sin on the cross. It's just too big, but it's not true. We walk in these doors and we think, well, Jesus can't forgive me. He doesn't love me. He certainly doesn't know how I am. Really? He made you. Before you were even in your mother's womb, he knew your name. You see, that's why it's so powerful to know this book, because we have so many lies in our head. The enemy's planted so many seeds. Or a lot of times we come to church, we hear a good word, we hear a good seed. And I don't know about you, but many times I've walked out of the church and Satan's tried to snatch that seed up quick. Like he's trying to take away that word. Why? Because there's power in the word. This will change you. Our job's not to change this book. Our job is to let this book change us. And this book is not just a book. It's a living, it's a living word. It's God himself. You know, while I was getting ready to figure out how to close this message up, following Pete Button, home run hitter last week. Great job, by the way, Pete. God showed me the... You know what, for those of you that are new, if you walk out, there's a 10-year plan hanging on the wall. And as I was praying about this message, God just reminded me, he says, you know, that 10-year plan, and I didn't know this when we made it, but maybe I'm just not smart enough to ask God the question, but I started to realize the 10-year plan was everything God did in me, and now I'm giving it away to others. Now, I didn't realize that at first, but I'm sitting here giving you this message, and I'm thinking, wow, God, you know, we opened the Ridge Pantry. It was our, one of our first steps. And that was important to me because there was a community that we needed to help, and I, I just had a love for this community, but I didn't know how to reach them. But God just said, hey, just meet them right where they are. Meet them in their needs. And that's what God did for me. He met me right where I was. Now, I didn't have food insecurities, but it really doesn't matter what the need is, does it? And then Awaken, we opened Awaken. If you don't know, if, if that's where the football game is going to be today, Awaken. It's a great facility that God has blessed us with. And I got called into ministry. I started as a youth pastor right here at this church in 2000. 2000 and 2006, I was the youth pastor here. Now, I remember in Peru, I was preaching one day, and, and by the way, uh, it wasn't just that I was the youth pastor. I was working with the youth as a youth, well, they would call me a leader. I was just whatever. And I, we would start taking kids. Like, I would take kids to these youth conferences. They were called Acquire the Fire. There was all these great conferences we would take these kids to. And I'm taking these kids going, man, Jesus is going to change these kids. But I went to the conference, and Jesus changed me. And so then I'm at this conference, and, and this uh, Ron Luce, he's a great man of God. In fact, if you're doing a discipleship, Ron Luce wrote the book that you're going through right now. And that's, he's been a big mentor of mine. But... So Ron Luce says, hey, if you want to go on missions, I'm like, man, that sounds great. I just, I like to travel. Like, I'm not thinking right. I'm thinking I want to travel. But he said, if you want to do missions, come. And so I went to this, Jen and I went to this mission thing, and we were newly married. And, and, uh, and he said, I said, yeah, I want to go. And so all I did was sign up to go on missions. But here, Teen Mania calls me and says, no, you're going to lead 30 teenagers. I'm like, lead 30 teenagers? I'm barely even saved. So we take 30 kids and we go to Peru and we're, we're, I mean, they did all this training. They taught us all these great things. I'm forever grateful for what they taught us. But I go to Peru and uh, they said, hey, John, you need to preach. And I go and preach and I bomb the message. I think I've told you the story, but if you're new, I bomb the message terribly. But because it was in Spanish, the translator saved the message. <laughs> Praise God. That was so good. But I knew I bombed the message. I don't even know what I said. I'm like, you know, 
love Jesus or you're going to hell or something crazy. I don't know what I said. But I got off the stage and I was so upset. I'm like, I'm never going to be a preacher. I'm never going to be a pastor. My pastor told me before I left, you're called to be in ministry. You're called to be a pastor. I said, never, ever, forget it. This stinks. And 20 people surrounded me, started praying for me in some weird tongue called Spanish. And they tr my translator said, they all spoke that you're supposed to be in ministry. But that happened at a youth group a youth missions trip. I thought I was going to change them, people in Peru and these kids, and here God changed me. And so that's why Awaken means so much to me because it matters what, we have to invest in teenagers. We have to. They're not the next generation coming up. They're leaders today. They're leaders now. Now. That's why I awaken. That's why this vision means so much to me. And then I get called into ministry. Well, how do you lead as a pastor? How do you become a pastor? I don't know. But I'm so thankful my founding pastor came alongside me and said, hey, John, let's go to school. And I'm like, well, that means I have to leave. No, no, no. I went to Liberty University online, and I got to work and do ministry hands-on while I was going to school. And so that's why Ridge School is so important to me. That's why Ridge University, you'll see it on the board. Look, I want to train people that are called into ministry. I want to train them in-house. A lot of times when someone gets called into ministry, i got to send them to like Dallas Theological or Rama in Oklahoma. And then, yeah, you'll come back. They never come back. And that's okay. Like God calls it. But that's why it's my heart to like, we need to train people here now. If they're called, let's train them now. Let's get them into a university. Look, this is so important, learning, going to educate, going to Bible school. That's so important. But you know what they can't teach you? What happens in ministry. They can teach you promises and truths and fundamentals, but they can't teach you how to handle this situation. Someone's coming to you, calling you in the middle of the night because their marriage is on the rocks. What do you do? How do you handle it? They can't teach you those things. But you, that's why I have such a heart. Like, we need to do both. The education is important, but the people skills. Oh, how many of you at work just like the people skills? You got It's something you just got to learn. You got to walk through it. But it's so much better to learn from Jesus first before you do people skills. I wish I would have had that in reverse because my people skills were bad when I was a manager. A lot of cursing and swearing and getting people manipulating them to get what I want. That's not the way God leads. But I'm so thankful he saved me. I'm so thankful he changed how I think and how I see and how I talk and how I treat people. I'm so thankful he did that for me. Now I can do that for other people. Do you see how it works? Love God. Love people. But you're in the middle of all those things. You've got to choose to love God. And you've got to choose to receive from God. And then you've got to choose to love people. Stand your feet. I just want to pray for you. I just want to ask you one simple question. And this may be easy for you. It may be hard for you. It's a simple but complex question. Where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? We're about to worship the living God. Where's your treasure? If he looks at your heart, what does he see? And by the way, he's not here to condemn you. God doesn't condemn. He's here to help you. And it's okay. I want you to hear me. It's okay if you're not there today. It's okay if your treasure's in the wrong thing, but I want you to start asking the Lord, Lord, what is it you desire from me? What is it you want from me? How can I keep walking towards you? Let him, let him work with who you are. Let him work with what he's put inside of you. Remember, he created you. So he not only gets you, he knows what's best for you. So Lord, I just pray for every person online, every person in this room. And Lord, if there's anybody right now that's listening in or, or in this room, if they haven't given their life to Jesus, that's where it starts, Lord. Just If they're not following you today, that's where it starts. And so Holy Spirit, it, look, they know. I, I remember when I was in that place, I, I knew I needed to make this change. And if that's you, you've got to come to a place where you can say, Jesus, I want to follow you and start taking those steps. Start taking those steps. It's not important that you're going to be where I am today. What's important is you take step number one. And say, God, I'm willing, and I'm going to follow you. And Lord, if there's anybody in here today, maybe they're a believer, but they've gotten their priorities messed up. They're working for the wrong things. Lord, we remember that nothing 
on this earth that's going to remain. It's the only thing that's going to remain for eternity is your word and you. And so, God, we want to make sure that our priorities are right, that you, we love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. God, you will bless everything we put our hands to when you're our priority. That's the promise. Joshua 1, 8 and 9 says, if we'll meditate on the word day and night, prosperity and success, prosperity and success. Now, that is not so you can get rich. It's so you can keep walking and and Jesus and prosper in the faith and prosper in the kingdom of God. Will he give you wealth? He may. The important part isn't what you have. It's not, it's not what you own. It's not how much money is in your bank account. The important part is, is that you're following the loving God that is here to bless you and help you and he'll be with you all of your days. You keep following him. He'll do the heavy lifting. He'll do the hard work. You just keep choosing to worship him, choosing to, to worship and pray choosing to have a relationship with him and choosing to trust that's the one thing I got out of my prayer time before the service is a lot of you don't trust Jesus and that's look I understand there's a lot of people that hurt you in your life but this is a God who is, will never hurt you this is a God that will never deceive you this is a God that went to the cross for you this is a God who paid the price for you you can trust him you can trust his word Lord, I just give you every person. Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Does. Where's my treasure? In Jesus' name, I'm not saying.